And, and as you're dedicated, as you're consistent, as you're persistent despite the discouragement, you'll begin to see some foundation of familiarity forming. And that familiarity gives way to more familiarity. So the more familiar you become with the stories, with the writings, with the letters, the more understanding you gain. The more understanding you gain, the more familiar you become with the writings. And this is a cycle of understanding that repeats until you've mastered the grasp on the scriptures and you understand what you're reading exactly. And then you begin to study the details and a beautiful picture is painted for us. For instance, here's something else I wrote for you. For instance, if someone is reading about the Passover for the first time in the Old Testament, if someone is reading about the Passover for the first time, they'll learn about how God sent an angel of death over the land of Egypt and about how God protected the Israelites through the blood of the lambs. Once they are familiar with that story, they are more likely to make the connection between the Passover lamb and Christ's crucifixion. You begin to see themes uh, threaded throughout all of the Old and New Testament, like the seed who is the son of God. You begin to see themes like covenant. You begin to see themes like redemption and so forth. And you begin to follow these threads and they start to make more and more sense. So, you may be discouraged. You may be wondering if you're ever going to get a grasp on the scripture, but don't allow that intimidation. Don't allow that confusion to keep you from continuing to study the word because every time you read it, again, this is why many believers quit. Every time you read it, you become more familiar with it. Don't quit the word of God just because you don't understand what's happening right away. You have to, it's, it's like, uh, for example, you ever watch a confusing movie? And then you have to watch it again and again and again. And then it finally starts to make sense. Same thing with the word. You got to read it again and again and again. And things really begin to become a clear picture for you as you're consistent in the word. So number one is revelation. Ask the Holy Spirit to teach you. You have to begin there or you're not going to get anywhere. Number two is dedication. Have consistency in your devotion to the scripture. And again, the more dedicated you are, the more familiar you become with the Word of God. And each time you read the Word, your understanding will grow, even if just incrementally. I'll take a little bit of growth over no growth anytime. Number three, observation and interpretation. So number one, this is very important, is revelation. Number two is dedication. Number three is observation and interpretation. Here's what 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 15 says. Study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. Let me just say something here that I think is really important. God gave you a rational mind. The same God who gave you a body, a spirit, the same God who gave you emotions, also gave you a rational mind. We have to stop acting like the rational mind is against the spirit. Now, we understand the Bible talks against the mind of the flesh, but the mind of the flesh is the sin nature. I'm not talking about the sin nature. I'm talking about the ability to reason. The ability to reason. Spiritual intellect is of God. I mean, just look at different examples in the Old and New Testament. You'll see many times that the spirit field had a very sharp mind. In fact, a sharp mind is one of the manifestations of the spirit-filled life. The ability to reason, the ability to persuade, the ability to teach and to explain, the ability to understand, the ability to receive the wisdom of heaven. These are marks of the spirit field. Revelation is knowledge set on fire by the Holy Ghost. So we have to stop being so dismissive with the mind. We say things like, well, you have, what, what is the word that many people use? You have... Um, head knowledge, I have revelation. Well, no, that's, that, that's almost true, but you have to understand too that revelation ultimately brings fruitfulness in the head knowledge, in your intellect, in your natural understanding. Revelation affects those things about you. Just as we experience emotions when we're being touched by the presence of God, so the mind is affected when you begin to surrender to the Holy Spirit. The most surrendered people I know have the sharpest minds. They're not gullible. They're not tossed to and fro. They don't believe anything that's just presented to them. 
They ask questions. They dig deeper. They study. In fact, that's part of the passion that the Holy Spirit gives you for the Word is this hunger to know and to study and receive. That is not an evil thing. And we have to stop acting like receiving knowledge by the Holy Spirit is somehow going to affect you negatively in your spiritual growth. No, it's just the opposite. True spiritual knowledge works hand in hand with spiritual encounters that God wants to give to you. So study to show yourself approved. There's nothing wrong with that. And in fact, we have to understand too, and many of you won't like that I'm saying this, but I have to tell you because I love you. You have to understand that the word of God is not, it's not like a fortune cookie. It's not like we can go into the word of God and say, well, you know, this is what it means to you and this is what it means to me. No, we have to realize that when the Holy Spirit inspired the scripture, he inspired the scripture with intention. There is meaning behind what the Holy Spirit has given to us. There's a purpose behind every word that was written. He has a will for all of the messages contained in the word of God. It's not up to us to say, well, I'm just going to read it casually, and then I'm going to apply what I think it means. That's not the spirit. That's called rationalizing out of your own imagination. That's almost like prophesying out of your own imagination. It's not like we could just take the scripture as a general encouragement that we can apply any way that we want. No, the verses, the stories, the narratives, every word from the word of God has a purpose. So there is meaning. There is intention. Study of the word of God is not about making up your own meaning or deciding what it means to you. Studying the word of God is about finding out what the Holy Spirit intended to communicate through any particular story or verse. And so when you begin to study the word, you realize that there are barriers. There are safety nets. Look, anything without boundaries is chaotic. Everything that God ever designed or created has boundaries, has laws. Think about the laws of physics that God set into place in creation. Think about the spiritual laws. Think about the moral laws. Think about uh, the laws of mathematics. There are many different laws that govern reality that God created. God is a God of order, not of disorder. In the same way, there are certain boundaries that we have to respect when we're studying the word. I can't just pull up a scripture and go, hmm, what can I make this mean? Or what's a cool play on words I can use to sound like I know what I'm talking about? Or let me take this story from the scripture and make everything allegorical and let me pull out a meaning that I think will fit with my sermon. No, my friend, that is not how we are to approach the word. The word of God is not something that we mold to say what we want. It's not like we just take the words and intend them to mean what we want them to mean. We have to look at the scripture and say, Holy Spirit, what did you intend to communicate through this story, through these verses? And if we do this, we will find a solid foundation upon which we can stand. And we stay away from error and strange doctrine and bizarre teachings that don't glorify the Holy Spirit or Jesus. So we must apply practical study to our spiritual devotion. This is why I say observation and interpretation are necessary. Now, observation and interpretation really are one. They improve upon the other. As you read the scripture, you observe things, and then you seek to find the interpretation of what you've observed. And in doing this, that interpretation helps you to make better observations. Those observations help you to make better interpretations. And this leads us to talking about the study method, which I call macro, micro, macro. Write that down or say it in the comments. Macro. M-A-C-R-O, micro, macro, macro, micro, macro. Remember this, big picture, small details, big picture. Again, big picture, small details, big picture. What do I mean by that? Well, let's take a look at big picture first. When you approach the word, you sit down to read the scripture. Start with the big picture. For instance, identify what kind of book you're reading. I'll give you the examples here. We have the law or the Pentateuch, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy. That's the law. Then you have the Old Testament historical books or historical narratives. These are the stories that we read or record keeping. Joshua, Judges, Ruth, First and Second Samuel, 